Hey, I'm going to ask for some special prayer real quick um, for two things. One, my wife is, um, she spent most of the morning crying. Uh, her mom is um, in her 90s, and this is, she's down to her last probably day or two. So she's on her way right now to drive to Ledbetter to spend time with family and her mom. And appreciate um, prayer for her as she drives and uh, for grace and peace as the family gets there. And then also I want to pray again for our youth going to camp. So can I lead us in prayer? Lord, I do lift up Rebecca and, and the, the family. Lord, we'd give uh, Rebecca a safe trip and others who might be traveling. Pray that there would be real peace that passes understanding around that bedside. That uh, we know that um, Rebecca's mom has lived a godly, wonderful life. And pray that you would reward her by taking her sweetly into your presence. Lord, I also pray for our youth going to camp. I'm praying for a collision to take place there, uh, a collision of hungry hearts and the power of your spirit to, to impact each other. And Lord, I pray that, I do pray for the kids to have a great time at camp and grow to know each other better and to make friends and to have great time and all that kind of stuff. But Lord, I, I'm really praying for you to intersect with these hearts Bring some kids back changed differently. People that never thought of it before, but you might want them to stand up and be a light in Madison or MacArthur or whatever school they go to or in their neighborhoods. Lord, change some of our youth. Make them strong. Make them leaders that George and the workers can, can count on these people uh, to be faithfully present and to be participating. Lord, again, we pray for that week at Camp Beagle and pray for a safe trip there and back. And Lord, I'm praying for the service today. Would you, this, we're, we're here for you. We're not here for us. We're not here because of a habit or a routine. We're here because we want to be in your presence. We want to use your word. And we know, we know that your word, when it's spoken out, it will, not, it will not return to you void, that you will accomplish the purposes you intend. So Lord, uh, give me clarity to speak guard my mouth, that it would be things that you have prepared me to say and that in accordance to your will. And Lord, I pray for people here that as they hear these words today, they don't have hearts with Teflon on them, that these things hit and slide off. But Lord, I pray for hearts with Velcro, that these things stick and cling, even as we go out into San Antonio. So Lord, we love you and praise you. And we do give you all the glory, every bit of it. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 today, and uh, we're at the end of the life of Jesus Christ on earth. It's been a wonderful ride for over years. We've talked about um, the book of Luke, and we're in Luke 19 today, where Jesus, uh, after he left Jerusalem as a teenager, uh, to our knowledge, he never went back. He's always at Capernaum and Galilee and Samaria, Bethany, and, but he all, all through the book of Luke, it kept saying... One day he's going to Jerusalem. One day Jerusalem. Because at Jerusalem, that's where he's going to enter the city and then end up being arrested and crucified and, and resurrecting. And I tried to think today what that scene was like. Once again, as a former youth minister, I, I don't want to just use the Bible. I mean, that's what I use fundamentally and a lot. But just as Jesus told the parables, I try to think of, can I give people a visual that they think, oh, that's what it was like. So I have a visual for you today of what that was like when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. You gotta remember, this is Passover week. That means literally, without exaggerating, there's several hundred thousand, several hundred thousand Jews gathering because it was, it was a requirement to come to celebrate in Jerusalem. And it's in the midst of this crowd, Jesus finally makes his appearance, and he's done all these miracles and amazing teaching, and as he enters the city, he gets an incredible welcome. So I have a two-minute clip to, that shows an American president being welcomed, and I want you to think of how it was for Jesus to be welcomed with similar passion. So let's watch this. Walk out and be the man in the arena on a on a stage set constructed overnight to place him in the middle of this room.
This is after 9-11, when everybody loved George Bush, and you can see this, this welcome. Think of Jesus walking into the city with crowds much larger than this, cheering him on. All right, that's good. Can you imagine in the middle of that adulation and celebration and excitement, and I'm not being political, I'm just making a point, if Nancy Pelosi went on the stage and said, everybody be quiet, be quiet. It would not have happened, right? What would have happened? They would have yelled louder. And today we're going to see When Jesus has that kind of welcome, that kind of celebration, the Pharisees are going to come out and say, hey, stop. Just be quiet. That'd be like a longhorn going to A&M at the days when they had the giant campfire and saying, hey, Aggies, everybody shush. Think that's going to happen? That's like going to a Spurs game. And some Dallas Maverick fan saying, boo. Mike, I'm sorry. (laughs) I want you to really picture this because this is the only way to understand this account. How about at New York Times? Caleb, we have that picture. Times Square. At New Year's, tens of thousands of people gather there because the calendar's gonna change. There's nothing to celebrate. Nothing changes when the clock hits zero, except if you're with your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend, you kiss them. And yet people scream their heads off and they're blowing, and they're jumping around and dancing, why? There's nothing to celebrate. Rebecca and I spent years saying, okay, what do we want to do at New Year's and everything? Now at about 11.30, hey, you ready to go to bed? Yeah, let's go. We don't care. Because, well, we, and we go to bed because it's pointless because our dogs hear all the fireworks and they go hyper crazy. Let's turn to Luke chapter 19 and let's read this account. Luke 19, verse 36. And as he, that's Jesus, was going... They were spreading their coats (coughs) on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, picture this in your mind, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God. Two, Two words I want you to notice here. Joyfully and with a loud voice. Joyfully and with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. And they were shouting, blessed is the name, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. That word praise is not a real common word. It's the Greek word, aneho. The last time this was used, this word in the book of Luke was all the way back at Luke chapter 2. And this might sound familiar. Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host 
praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. And now that same word for praise that was used to inaugurate the life of Jesus Christ is being used to inaugurate the last week of his life. They're like bookends. They open and close the passage together. I think of those words joyfully and loud. I have not studied, I've never done an exhaustive study on worship. I have done studies. Matt's probably done a lot more than I have. But I can tell you some conclusions I have drawn. And one of them is that the, the praise that I see in the Bible is loud and it's joyful. When I look through the Bible, when I see the book of Revelation, it's, it talks about the loud voice. It talks about shouting. There's excitement. There's enthusiasm. When I read in Psalms about the clanging of the cymbals and the voices and once again shouting and joy, that's how I see praise in Psalms. When I see Jericho, they didn't put the, the army fighters in front. They put the singers in front. And they, they went out, and once again, they were going to be shouting, loud, joyful. When I think of David, when the ark came back, it was loud, joyful. David broke into a river dance or some kind of dance and said he really cut a rug. Every time, every time I see praise in the Bible, it's loud and joyful. Now, I'm sure there's probably an exception here and there, but what I see is a pattern at least an overriding pattern of joyfulness and praise. So these people are singing and yelling and shouting and jumping up and down. Lord, Jesus, Hosanna. Now here's the problem. I think a lot of them missed what they were praising. And sometimes you can, you can, you can worship worship. Does that make sense? You can get so caught up in the form of what a worship band should look like that you put all your energy in, in the, man, this has to look exactly right, and we got to have this exactly right. We need these lights this way, and what. And these people, I think the majority of them were excited, and the Bible says, why? Why? What, what were they excited about? Anybody? The miracles. The miracles. That's why they were excited, because Jesus had done all these miracles. They weren't excited because he was the Son of God. They weren't excited about the truth he gave. It says they were excited because of the miracles. They wanted a Vegas Jesus. They wanted Jesus that was going to be on Israel's Got Talent. I didn't even know there was. I looked it up, and they do have it. Israel's got talent. Shalom, bro. They wanted Jesus to come out and say, and for my next trick, I'm going to raise two people from the dead. Shazam! And the people would have clapped. Yeah! Jesus was not looking for fans. We say this often. He was not looking for fans. What was he looking for? Followers. And what's a follower? Jesus gave you that uh, definition in Luke 9, 23. He said, if anybody wants to follow me, they need to deny themselves, take up their cross, and then what? And then follow me. Jesus wasn't looking for big crowds. We'd look around and say, where's a big crowd? Where's a big crowd? Jesus would send the crowds away. He even said, his own disciples, are you going to leave me too? I started thinking about COVID and this related to this. You know, one thing that was said way back at the beginning, you remember this phrase, follow the what? You guys heard it too, follow the science. And what that really meant was follow the opinion of someone that we're going to set up to be an expert and then do what they say. To me, that's not follow the science. To me, that's follow the scientist and his theories. 
And we know that the, the experts had to change what they thought many times. So there's a misnomer when we talk about follow the science. Right now on this earth, there's at least 7 billion people. And I started thinking most of the people on this earth are, they're even, either trying to follow the science of wealth, they're trying to follow the science of adventure, they're trying to follow the science of the next great relationship, they're trying to follow the science of <coughs> committing violence on other people, they're trying to commit, follow the science of being famous. And what that tells me, out of the seven billion people on this planet, there are a lot of people that are shallow down deep. It's not substance, it's the next thing. It's the next thing, it's the next thing. Scientific theory reduces humanity to a bunch of tiny insignificant atoms crawling around on a small planet in the middle of the vastness of almost inexplorable space. And we can look at life and quantify it as a respiratory system, and a digestive system, and a reproductive system, and we can analyze life all we want, but none of that explains why is there life. Where is meaning in life? If you're a person in San Antonio, the one thing you almost have to have is hope. And I've said for years, you can live about 40 days or more without food. You can live up to seven days without water. You can live about four minutes without air. How long can you live without hope? You know, suicide's the second leading cause of people in the age of 15 to 25. In the prime of life, People are taking their lives right after accidents. Why? Because they look at life and they, they don't see anything ahead. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll try to find a job and I'll, I'll work like crazy. I'll get a couple days off a week, a couple weeks off a year, and I'll do that for the next 50 years, and then I'll retire and sit in a rocking chair and watch reruns on TV. And they say, why, why go through that? That's... That's not living, that's, li that's existing. Where is significance? Where's purpose? Where's relevance? I want something that fulfills me, not amuses me. You know, and what I said about Christianity, these people praising for the miracles, you know, Matt is awesome. I love Matt to death. I tell him that often. And we could not have a better associate pastor. And I mean that seriously. He is awesome. But Matt can't do some things. He can do a lot of things. There's some things he can't do. And he can't make you be a worshiper. He is a worship leader. He's going to get up with his heart and he's going to sing songs that he's prayed over and prepared, and he's going to do them whether you're here or not. And he can, he can practice with the praise team. He can, he can pick out songs. He can tune his guitar. But that will not make you praise when you come in this room. It's either in your heart or not to know Jesus Christ is Lord, or you're here for some other reason. And this crowd, all these people that are shouting, do you know most of them in a week's time are going to be not saying, praise Jesus. You know what they're going to be saying? They're going to be saying, crucify Jesus. They flip 180. When Jesus doesn't do the miracles, when he doesn't fulfill their expectations, they want him dead. That is crazy. Now let's get over to Luke 19, verse 39 through 40. There can be real passion in worship. We already said there's two words. What are the two words? Loud and what? Let's say it again. The two words are what? 
and loud. I got, somebody said it backwards, that's great, because there's no right order. Loud and pr- joyful or joyful and loud, as long as you get those two words one way, you got it. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, Jesus, your, your disciples are making fools of themselves. Shush them. Did your mom, probably not your dad, but your mom ever say shush? Shush. Kenny may remember this. Kenny, where are you? Okay, this is my brother. Do you remember when I used to say a da 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 all the time? He does. Do you remember what mom did? My mom, bless her heart, as I got older, I thought I was equal. And so my mom would tell me to do something, and for some reason, I would go, a da 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 I thought it was kind of funny. And she'd say, Charlie, don't say that. And I'd say, a da 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 You probably can't believe your pastor would provoke anybody. I know. But I would do that. And finally one day, my mom said it in a different way. She said, stop it. And Kenny's right here. He probably remembers. I said, a da 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 You know what my mom did? Whap! She knocked me almost into the kitchen sink. I didn't know my mom had it. And I was like impressed. Wow! My mom loves me. <laughs> and I didn't say a da 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 for a week after that. And then I said it under my breath. And these guys are saying, shush, stop. Just, just close your mouth. Shut your yapper. Stop. And Jesus answered, I, t- I like how he starts it, I tell you. That's like John Wayne. Remember John Wayne movies and somebody's telling him you can't do that and John Wayne says, Okay, now listen and listen tight, pilgrim. You get off the property now, I'm going to shoot you dead. Get gone, buddy. Remember John Wayne doing that stuff? Man, when John Wayne held his finger out, I ran in the living room. He scared me to death. Now listen and listen tight. Yes, I'm listening. And Jesus pulls that finger out, and he goes, I tell you, brethren, I tell you, If these became silent, the stones would cry out. I don't think Jesus sounded like John Wayne. I really don't. He was Jewish. It would have been different. But do you hear what he said? I tell you, if these stones were to be quiet, or if these people were to be quiet, the stones would cry out. Now, we know from the Bible, the Pharisees, were always the people that reigned on the parade of Jesus. Through his entire life, sometimes the Sadducees, sometimes other people, but always, always, always the Pharisees. They were the religious people. They were, you go by the rules people. And Jesus said, I'm not coming here to start a religion. I'm coming here to start a way of life. I have come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. And the Pharisees, all they wanted to do was keep trying to put Jesus in a box, put him in the Jesus box, keep him under control, let him out for an hour or two on Sunday, and that's enough. And let me ask you a question. If somebody told you today, you don't praise Jesus, what would your response be? You don't have to answer out loud. But seriously, somebody told you, don't praise Jesus, what would you do? The first question that entered my mind is, why would I stop? Because you said? Because you said? You want me to stop because you said? Let me give you a couple verses. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. Gee, I've forgotten your name. (laughs) I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another nor my praise to idols. Jesus said, look, I'm the praise sheriff. It belongs to me. Me. 
For, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. He is the image of the, Jesus is the image of the visible God. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 14, because the word became flesh. Jesus became God and abide. He was the fleshly representation of God. And it says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the universe and heavens and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Guess what? Praise is all for him. It's all for him. I, I like sports, I admit that. And I'm amazed when a football player takes an oblong piece of pig skin and runs into the end zone, how 80,000 people will go screaming. And he, they can run and jump into the edge of the stands and people are breaking their neck to touch a sweaty guy. Let me touch your sweat. Oh, I'll never wash his hand again. What? I follow sports, but that's ridiculous to idolize people for that. A guy could jump and put a ball through a, a, a cylinder, and we're going to give him $40 million and worship for that? No, not on my watch. My worship is reserved for one person Jesus Christ the Lord. In a small way, my wife. <laughs> Why praise Jesus? Why not praise Jesus? If, the, if these people keep quiet, the stones will cry out. That tells me we have the responsibility to praise. We have that responsibility. That's our role, is to praise him. And if we don't, the rocks will. And if you're following, you know what we just created. Rock and roll. That, yeah, I know. But it works. That either the rocks will praise or we will, but that is our responsibility. I have another video to show. And this, to me, is what it was like if, if the people had been quiet if they'd been quiet, I think this is what, now these, these are frogs, but I want you to picture these frogs as rocks, okay? Let's watch this. In my distorted little mind, I pictured Jesus turning to disciples, okay, just for fun, y'all y'all be quiet for a minute. And there's a rock over there, it goes, G, G. Another rock says, says, says. Another one says, Christ, Christ, G, says, Christ, Jesus Christ. And then another frog goes, Lord of Lords. Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and all the righteous are Jesus Christ, King of Kings, and Lord of Lord, and we will praise him forever and ever. That's how it would have gone. It would have been a rock concert. I put a picture of Brick Jagger right there. It would have been the Rolling Stones right there. He'd come, he'd come out, I can't get no resurrection till Jesus. I can't get no resurrection till Jesus. And you're saying that's crazy. No, I think it would have been exciting. It would have been marvelous. It says, you know, let me just think for a second. I, I was thinking this morning at breakfast, although I didn't eat breakfast, but Rebecca was there, that what if other rocks talked in the Bible? What about when that lady was getting ready to be stoned for committing adultery? And Jesus said, 
all you without sin, what? Cast the first stone. And what if the rocks could talk right there? And a guy is sitting there squeezing a rock, and he's ready to throw it, and that rock starts saying, nobody, no, no. And the guy's like, what, what? And he looks down, looks at the rock. I said, drop me now. And he drops the rock. What about David when he's picking up the stones in the creek? Remember how many he picked up? Picked up five. And then he's looking at the stones and saying, which one should I get? And there's a really nice rock. And he says, this one. And then the other rocks start going, if you like it, you better put a sling on it. <laughs> Some of y'all don't get that one. And then the third one, Moses is in the desert. And there's a big rock, and, and he's saying, look, I don't have any water. I don't have any water. What can I do? And the, the giant rock says, don't take me for granted. I'm full of quartz. And Moses goes, quartz? What good is that? That won't do me any good. He says, not quartz, quartz. I'm filled with about 40,000 quarts of water. And, and then Moses says, okay, and he hits it, and the water comes out. Now, these are crazy examples, but that's the way my mind works. I sat there this week, and I started going through all kinds of permutations, and I couldn't stop my brain. It just went on and on, because I thought, this would have been the most exciting thing outside of the resurrection that maybe ever happened. Thousands of rocks singing praise songs. You know, we, we're watching the forest fires in Texas and California and Arizona. And they say forest fires don't start because somebody walked out with a blowtorch and just lit about an acre on fire. It's usually a small spark off a piece of metal hit by a car going by and, and the sparks will come and get in the, the dry grass or a cigarette butt or a campfire that's not completely out, although it looks like it's out. And then the next thing you know, the, that area catches on fire. Next thing you know, it's hundreds of thousands of acres being burned up. I think that's what authentic praise is. Matt is the worship leader, and he's coming in saying, look, I have a heart to worship. I have a heart to praise. I hope you came in hungering and thirsting because together we can collectively unite our hearts first and then our voices, and we have the privilege we have the awesome privilege, the role, the responsibility, the joy of praising Lord God Almighty. Psalms chapter 98, verse 6 through 8 says, With trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout, guess what? Shout joyfully. Here we go again. That's loud and joyful at the same time before the King and the Lord. May the sea Roar. Now here's other things getting involved in the praise thing. The seas roar and all it contains. The fish are out there singing. The world and all those who dwell in it. May the rivers clap their hands. And may the mountains sing together for joy. Wouldn't you like to see what Mount Everest could sing? Isaiah 55 verse 12. For you will go out with, guess what? Here we go again, joy and be led in peace. The mountains and the hills will break into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands and the hills are alive with the sound of music. That's not in the Bible, I just thought I'd throw that in there. The hills are alive with the sound of music, the songs that they sung for thousands of years. Do you see the Bible clearly says that everything on this earth is built for praise? Everything. Everything. And some people don't know who to praise. They pray their job, their cell phone, the next relationship, their zip code. Man, we get to, to, to praise the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.5. You also, as living stones. Here's the Bible calling us, what? Your stones. Your stones. I'm a stone. You're a stone. Wouldn't you like to be a stone too? 
you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. What's that verse say about we offer, offer the sacrifice of what? Praise. And here it is in the New Testament. We are to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, there's a great verse in Psalms that says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to a Dallas Cowboys game. Is that what it says? I was glad when they said to me, let's go to Lupe's Tortillas. I'm honest, I, I would be glad if somebody said, let's go. I was glad when they said to me, let's go skiing today. Let's fly to Alaska and go snow skiing to get out of 105 degrees. The Bible says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into what? The house of God. See, if you have that attitude when you come in on Sunday, you're not going to be able to hear Matt. Your, your heart's going to be so revved up and excited, you're going to out-sing the guy with a microphone. I'm going to close with one passage. Psalm, whole, the whole chapter is great, but I'm going to read four verses out of Psalms 100. You ready? These verses need Velcro. They don't need Teflon. These need Velcro. You ready? Shout joyfully again. Over and over, all through scripture, those are the two words associated with praise. Joy loud. Joy loud. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with jubilation. Come before him with rejoicing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And look at this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time today that we could open your word. I know we looked at several passages today, but they all say the same thing. You alone are worth worship. You alone are worth everything that's in our heart, in our mind, in our soul. We have the opportunity. It's not a job. It's a, it's a divine responsibility of, of love to extend back to you the praise that belongs to you, the joy that we have in, in worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords. We don't need any rocks in this room today. This is the body of people that love you, that would love to worship you. Lord, I pray, even as our youth leave here today, they would get to camp and they would be the ones at that camp that are ready to praise when the services are going. They, they would be praise leaders sitting around that camp room. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.